Hi everyone, welcome to the Mummy Movie Podcast, where we are looking at the Brazilian film The Secret of the Mummy from 1982. In terms of the uh, the format for this episode, it's uh, going to be the same as usual. We shall start by taking a look at the uh, the history the film presents, and then I shall review the film and rate it out of 10. But before then, well, I'm sure a lot of you know the drill by now. It is time for the dramatic intro. Right. You are a mad scientist who has discovered the elixir of life. Now you need the perfect subject. As such, you murder a group of people who hold different parts to an ancient map. You then use that map to travel to Egypt, where you find a long lost, intact tomb with a perfectly preserved mummy. Using the elixir, as well as the work of Dr. Frankenstein, you raise the mummy from the dead and send it on a mission to kill all those who laughed at you. However, little do you realize that the mummy has its own goal. Thousands of years ago, the mummy lost its ancient love. As such, he begins to search the local area for a suitable host for her soul. This activity does not go unnoticed, and the police begin to narrow down the search to your very house. Soon, you will inadvertently become the victim of the secret of the mummy. Right, um, we've now arrived at the, the history section. To be honest though, this film really doesn't do that much new. In fact, although it is uh, undeniably a very unusual film, it also almost seems um, to sort of like go out of its way to hit every single mummy trope, even when it's a detriment to itself. We'll get into it more during the review section. But what this means is that, well, once again, we get the chance to use this film as a jumping off point to look at an incredibly interesting and in this case an incredibly underappreciated discovery. Or at least I think it's incredibly underappreciated anyway. In the film it's implied that the tomb they discover is completely intact. So we're going to look at the uh, the discovery of the the only two completely undisturbed royal ancient Egyptian tombs. Now, you're probably thinking that one of these is going to be Tutankhamun. I know that even on this podcast I have spoken about how um, intact that tomb was, but technically speaking it, it wasn't undisturbed. It had actually been robbed twice in antiquity. However, in many ways our story does start with the boy Pharaoh. It was 1929 and the tomb of Tutankhamun had just finished being cleared. Ever since its discovery in 1922, the interest in ancient Egypt had flourished across the world, bringing about a new wave of Egyptomania that inspired everything from cinema, <laughs> including many of the films I've reviewed on this very podcast, architecture, art, literature, pretty much everything. It really can't be understated how significant this find had been. So much so that um, the French Egyptologist Pierre Montet wanted to find an equally incredible discovery. And so, now that it was believed that the Valley of the Kings was all but cleared, he headed over 800 kilometres to the north, arriving at a settlement in the northeastern delta. This site had first been excavated by Flinders Petrie in 1884, and well, due to the large amount of Ramesside stonework there, it had long been believed to be the biblical city of Per Ramesses, the location where supposedly the Hebrew people had been enslaved in the Exodus story. What better place to start looking for the next great find. 
Montet was a man who was often well-dressed, with round glasses, and often seemed to start the day with neatly combed hair, only for it to be a mess by the end with the, uh, you know, the day's activities. So, in 1929, Montet began his excavations. However, during the next ten years, he made a discovery. This was not the city of Paramesis. Instead, it was a city named Tanis. In fact, Paramesis would not be discovered until the 1960s, and it was about 11 miles away from Tanis. It turned out that the reason that there was a lot of kind of like Ramesside stonework in Tanis was simply because it had been taken from Paramesis and repurposed. However, this was not to say that Tanis did not have its own significance. In fact, having first been established in the 19th dynasty, it had grown in importance and eventually become the capital of the 21st and 22nd dynasties. Then, going back to 1939, after ten years of excavation, a seemingly small anomaly in the southwest corner of the site led to what was essentially an incredible find. Montet noticed that an enclosure wall did not parallel the wall of the, the Temple of Amon next to it. Finding this curious, he began to clear away the, uh, the mud brick-like structures there, and in doing so discovered a large limestone tomb beneath. After the mud brick structures, as, as well as the sand of many thousands of years had been cleared, he stepped over the threshold and gazed around the decorated walls. The depictions here suggested that it was the tomb of the 22nd dynasty ruler, Ozakon II. Moving into another room, he discovered the remains of the son and, and the successor of Ozakon II, Takelot II. Then, in yet another room, the funerary equipment of a third son. At this time, it was believed that the 21st and 22nd dynasties were, you know, somewhat poorer than the others. After all, not only were they not Egyptian in origin, um, they were actually Libyan, but also they didn't have quite such a firm grip on Egypt. For the 21st dynasty, the power was typically split down the middle, the pharaoh ruling from the north, uh, from Tanis, and the high priest of Amon ruling from the south, uh, from Thebes. Meanwhile, although uh, Shishok I, who interestingly was actually the, the first ever pharaoh named in the Bible, had managed to regain control of all of Egypt in the 22nd dynasty, he was the, the first ruler of the 22nd dynasty, and, and quickly after his reign, um, the dynasty had kind of shrunk, and, well, it had run parallel alongside the 23rd and 24th dynasties, each claiming different territories in, in the area. However, the finds in the tomb kind of forced a, a reimagining of the, the wealth of these dynasties. The funerary equipment here, after all, was of such an incredibly high quality that this view had to be brought into question. There is no doubt that this was an incredible find. I mean, after all, it's, it's not every day that you stumble upon a tomb that contains not just one, but two Egyptian, like, you know, kings and also a prince. However, this is not the, uh, the undisturbed burial I'm talking about here. This isn't one of the two tombs that was undisturbed. It, it had actually been plundered long ago in antiquity, and what was left was only a fraction of what had once been there. Montet began the process of clearing this tomb, and, well, once he had, on March the 18th, 1939, he found another tomb adjacent to it. This one was just a little bit different. You can almost imagine Montet's excitement as he stared upon the door, still sealed after thousands of years. You can imagine the thoughts of a discovery on the level of the boy king himself, Tutankhamun. It must have been painful having to do the initial excavations and recordings, which took three days in total. Then, on the third day, the tomb was opened. He headed down the entrance shaft, 
into the first chamber. Montet once again gazed around the decorated walls, noticing a reoccurring name, Aha Hepa Re Setep En Iman, the throne name of a, a pharaoh more commonly known as Pusenus I. Montet would have immediately realised the significance of this find. In the tomb, there were hundreds of Shabdis, um, so small servant figures that um, were believed to accompany the deceased into the afterlife where they would uh, come to life and serve them. There were also well-crafted bronze vessels. However, by far the most striking thing in the room was a coffin made not of gold, but of solid silver. Although the coffin was anthropoid in shape, as they gazed upon the head, they noticed that it was not sculpted in human form, but that of a falcon. Likely, this symbolised the pharaoh's divine kingship and his connection with the god Horus. At this moment, Montet stationed armed guards at the, uh, the entrance of the tomb, and then three days later, in the presence of the, uh, the king of Egypt himself, King Farouk, once again they headed inside. Slowly, they lifted off the lid of the coffin to reveal a golden face mask below. However, at this point, they were thrown a curveball. The hieroglyphs on the, the jewellery in the coffin revealed that this was not Pusenis I at all. Instead, it was a different and previously unknown pharaoh named Shishonk the second. Montet would likely have wanted to investigate this tomb more. However, unfortunately, time was just not on his side. It was 1939, and tensions across the globe were beginning to rise. Once again, for a second time, the world was on the brink of war. And so what should have been a careful, painstaking excavation was forced to be rushed. Only this one chamber was able to be excavated and the items within were transported to Cairo for essentially safekeeping. Montet then had to head back to Europe. However, it seems very likely that even on this trip home, he would have been thinking of ways to return. Right, finally, almost a year later, in uh, February of 1940, Montet made it back to Tanis and was able to continue his excavations. In the meantime, the, uh, the coffin of Shishok II had been sent to the anatomy apartment of Cairo University for studying. Unfortunately, unlike southern Egypt where no one is too far away from the desert, the delta region in the north is far more humid. Not only had this humidity damaged the body of Shishok II, but there was clearly evidence of water damage and roots had penetrated the base of the coffin and covered the bones there. It was clear that Shishok II's original tomb had become waterlogged and, well, as a result, he had been moved into this new tomb and, and reburied. As such, uh, the burial of Shishok II is also not one of the undisturbed tombs we are talking about here. Montet was therefore faced with a question. He had seen the inscriptions on the walls of this tomb. They had been for Pusenis I. So, where was he? On returning to the tomb, once again he continued to investigate and, well, soon he found a potential answer to his question. In the west wall of this chamber, in, you know, the chamber where they had discovered Shishonk II, there were two well-hidden doorways. He dismantled the, uh, the doorway on the right, 
the one that had been closest to the uh, the coffin of Shishok the second and then beyond it he saw a very promising sight a large granite plug still in place undisturbed in one corner there was enough room for him to peek through into the chamber beyond you could kind of almost imagine his breath catching in his throat as he saw glinting objects beyond carefully he began to remove this granite block well this process took six days in total and then when he was done he stepped into yet another chamber at the far end dominating the room was a large pink granite sarcophagus surrounding it were the uh, canopic equipment many shabdis and vessels of gold and silver on february 21st 1940 Montet raised the lid of the sarcophagus underneath he found yet another sarcophagus this one made of black granite and underneath that one was a coffin once again made of solid silver however this time rather than having a falcon head as uh, she shot the uh, the second's coffin had this one had a depiction of the king himself as Montet raised the lid of the coffin he once again saw a golden face mask beneath and on top of that many jewels donned the body the king's toes and fingers were encased in solid golden sleeves more elaborate than any that had been found before it the toes and fingernails had been melded into these and they were adorned with precious stones such as lapis lazuli the body itself was clearly of an old man and on later investigation it was discovered that his teeth were well they were in they must have been in incredibly bad condition on death and judging from his feet he had had such bad arthritis that he would have been crippled in the last years of his life so who was this man this was the body of Pusenis the first himself you may be wondering why have i never heard of this incredible find before why was there no publicity about this and after all there, there's no denying that it's an astounding find however the first reason is relatively obvious um it was 1940. okay montet had made it back to egypt to continue ex his excavations but there was still a war going on you know the world was still very much preoccupied by the second world war but also partly because of this as well there was no press when montet made this discovery further unlike howard carter who had had um harry burton an excellent uh, photographer with him montet had very little help here as such the photography was incredibly amateurish and relatively kind of like out of focus as well further to that once again we need to remember that um the discoveries in the southern in, in southern egypt tended to be far better preserved due to the dry conditions the humidity of the delta meant that although the uh, the gold silver and precious stones still remained all of the more you know like perishable items such as wood had long gone you know broken down by thousands of years of uh unfavorable conditions finally where the tomb of tutankhamun was recorded in multiple languages um this discovery was only ever published in french significantly limiting its audience nevertheless on april 16th once again king farouk arrived on the site and this time they went to the second hidden door you know in the uh, the the chamber where Shishonk the second was found once again they dismantled this once again they found it blocked off by a large granite plug suggesting that it was undisturbed once again arduously they removed this and on entering the tomb they found 
400 shanty figures, canopic equipment, a libation vessel, uh, essentially uh, that's for washing the body before its burial, and a large, uninscribed granite sarcophagus. The lid was lifted to reveal a badly damaged wooden coffin covered by gold leaf. Once again, when the lid of this was uh, lifted, two funerary masks were found beneath. This was the undisturbed tomb of Amenemope, the son of Persenus I and his successor. Unfortunately, just a month after this discovery, Germany invaded France. Once again, Montet was forced to end his excavations early, and this time he would not be able to return until after the end of the war. But either way, that is the story of the only two completely undisturbed royal tombs ever found. The tombs of Pusenis I and Amenemope. I wanted to tell this story because, well, on a personal level, I believe that these tombs and the work of Montat is highly underappreciated. So I hope you have enjoyed this historical accuracy section. Right, um, so we've now arrived at the uh, review section, and well, first things first. You can say what you want about this film, but you definitely can't deny that it has a very unique feel that really helps it to stand out. It's absolutely insane, with a, a style that almost makes it feel like you're watching a, a string of advertisements, you know, but like a string of advertisements that aren't really advertising anything. That's going to make no sense to anyone, I feel, but I, I just can't think of a better way of describing this film, to be honest. It's such a bizarre watch that it almost makes you feel like you're on, like, really heavy drugs when you're stone cold sober. On top of that, I did enjoy some of the performances of the, the actors as well. Bearing in mind that this is very much a, you know, like a horror comedy, it feels as if everyone is overreacting to a ridiculous degree, but in a weird way... It does kind of work. For instance, the, the professor in the film, who's kind of like the, the bad guy, um, he has the most over-the-top expressions that almost makes it look like his face is rubber. You know, the way his eyes widen to a ridiculous degree in his mouth and so on. And then you have Igor, because, <laughs> well, uh, of course, there has to be a character called Igor, doesn't there? But basically... Um, for a lot of the time, he seems to be acting exactly like Uncle Fester from the Adams Family. I will admit, I'm a big fan of the Adams Family, so I quite enjoyed that. You know, that's all I can really say about that. <laughs> um, but essentially, basically, in the film, the Professor uses uh, Igor for experiments and essentially turns him immortal. As such, Igor has promised to serve him for all time as, as you know, thanks, essentially. And, well... Honestly, his performance alone probably does push this, this whole film up a point. You know, so if I was going to rate it, say, like, 5 out of 10, it would push it up to being a 6. I also do quite like the uh, the nods to other novels and films in this one as well. So, for instance, um, in this world, Dr. Frankenstein was getting ready to create a human, but died before he could. Basically, the professor is using his work as inspiration. I also appreciate that they specify that Frankenstein wasn't trying to create a monster here. He was trying to create a human. Um, you know, trying to create a man. This point, uh, this is a point that many adaptions of Frankenstein uh, fail to grasp. And yet here, this, well, essentially this very silly, low-budget Brazilian horror comedy has, has hit the nail in the head, you know, on the head. Now, right, okay. Let's move on to the points that, um, the, the points that are funny, essentially. And I know this is supposed to be a, a horror comedy, but I, I really have no idea what parts here were intentionally supposed to be funny. It, it's actually really hard to tell, to tell, because structurally it jumps, you know, the film jumps all over the place, meaning that most of the time you just have no idea, really. <laughs> um, 
to show this, uh, let's look at the beginning. It starts with an old man giving several people parts of a map that leads to an ancient Egyptian tomb. Then all of these people, one by one, so there's about five or six in total, they all get killed in horrible ways as, uh, and then a man afterwards mysteriously picks up the, the, the pieces of the map. You know, clearly intending to, to put them together so he can find a tomb. That all happens in the first six minutes of the film. And bear in mind, in the middle of those two scenes, they do the credits. So really, what we're talking about here is the first three minutes, realistically. And I'm sorry, but, like, that's insane. That's, like, frantic. <laughs> And, and to be honest with you, Frantic is exactly how I would describe this film. Don't get me wrong, like, I always knew what was going on. I knew what the plot was. But it very much felt like, um, as the plot was going on, the film was trying to set up three other things that were going to happen later, or in some cases, just weren't going to be, you know, weren't going to happen at all. So, right, okay, for instance... At one point, we find out about the uh, the professor's discovery of the elixir of life, uh, elixir of life even, and his wish to bring a mummy back from the dead. You know, um, this would be you know the kind of uh, of scene that you would need to you know let breathe somewhat. You know, you, you need to let it breathe so you can appreciate it. However, in this film, whilst that's going on, we also have a reporter wandering around outside. We also find out about Igor and how he um, was experimented on by the professor. And then there's just a random scene with a beauty pageant. Like, I have no idea why that's there at all. I, I, I don't think that led to anything. Maybe I'm wrong, but if it did, I certainly have no idea what it was. It's just really, really odd. The film also randomly seems to switch between black and white in colour, and I couldn't really spot any rhyme or reason for this. At first, I kind of assumed it was because, you know, you had the, the scenes in the past and then the scenes in, in the present. You know, the ones in the past may have been in black and white, where the scenes in the present were in colour. But then they just randomly have scenes on the present that are in black and white as well. Also, all of the scenes set in ancient Egypt are in colour. So... What? Basically... <laughs> I, it kind of makes me wonder if they just didn't have money to film the entire film in colour, and I guess in, if that's the case, maybe they could have been a bit more strategic about it, but fair enough, I guess, you've got to work with what you've got. There are also just some really obvious continuity errors, errors here as well. For instance, when they awaken the mummy from the dead, the professor says, we must cut the bandages off. Then whenever you see the uh, the mummy after that, all of the bandages are just in completely perfect condition. Therefore, unless the mummy was, you know, particularly good at, at knitting, which, if I'm completely honest, like, they should have absolutely just done a scene where the mummy was just knitting his bandages back up. That would have been great. This is a hom hor like a horror comedy, after all, so I kind of feel that would have fit in quite well. But either way, like, as that scene's not there, I'm going to guess that this was a, quite a big mistake. <laughs> um, moving on. At one point, uh, the professor is is basically hosting a dinner party. Igor is acting as a kind of butler when the, the professor asks him to sing for the guests. Bear in mind, he's supposed to be this kind of, like, creepy, hunchbacked man with, like, uh, a, a snarling, raspy voice. In this scene, he just begins to sing in a beautiful, like, operatic style. I'm going to guess that this scene was actually supposed to be funny, and, well, it was, if I'm perfectly honest. It was just very surprising. But at the same time, I do actually wonder if it was him singing. If it was, fair play to him. Like I say, I don't know if that is actually the case, but it seemed like it might have been. Moving on, um, th the film tends to have a habit of randomly introducing new elements. So, uh, for a start, um, at about the 15 minute mark, bear in mind, this film is less than an hour and 10 minutes. So we're talking, we're approaching the end of the film here. We randomly just find out that the professor has a load of women held captive, uh, who he's like running experiments on. 
Now, you may be thinking, that doesn't sound very funny, but one of the women literally looks like a lion. And when I when I say a lion, I don't just mean a lion. I mean, they look like the, the cowardly lion from The Wizard of Oz. And I just have no idea why. I think the point here is that the mummy is, you know, kidnapping women to find a host for the soul for his beloved. But really, that wasn't that clear. And if that is the case, I don't get why there's a woman who, um, you know, looks like a lion. Uh, Oh, I just realised it. It's not supposed to be a lion. It is supposed to be a cat. Oh, for crying out loud. Cats. Ancient Egypt. For crying out loud. That's what they're doing here. Right. I, 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 I've got to move on. Oh, right. So... Right. When one of the new women is captured by, um, essentially she escapes and then like Igor basically, okay, so he attacks her essentially. The mummy then saves this woman, this woman, and then there's just like this weirdly beautiful scene. That's the only way I can describe it. Where the mummy goes to get her, I'm, I'm not even kidding by the way, the mummy goes to get her a bunch of flowers. Like, there is literally a scene where this woman is lying on the side of a lake when the mummy starts shuffling towards her with a bouquet. <laughs> the woman is about to accept when a load of police suddenly arrive and just start shooting the mummy mercilessly. The mummy then kind of like walks into a lake and sinks beneath the surface. I'm actually not going to lie, right? In an unironic way, I quite like the end of this film. It was clearly inspired by films like The The Mummy's Ghost and The Mummy 1959 with Christopher Lee. As well in these films, The The Mummy also dies in a similar way. Admittedly, in, the, in those films, it sinks into a bog, uh, you know, like into a swamp, where this one it's a lake. But you can still see there's quite um, clear inspiration. Right, let's move on to the kind of like downsides of the film. We have to at some point. The, the film definitely could have slowed down. I would say slow down a bit, but I think it needs to be about at least 50% slower. There, there's really like no time to breathe here at all. It was literally, um, essentially like onto the next thing, thing, onto the next thing, onto the next thing, onto the next thing, which also introduces five new things, which then go onto new things all in their own right, and then onto the next thing. And it just means like, there's no time to think at all in this film. You're just sitting there, like, your eyes wide open as you, as you watch. And it's just not very pleasant, let's put it that way. It's not a pleasant viewing. On top of that, the, the director just in general really confuses me. It feels like they've only ever watched one film, and it was one of the many versions of Frankenstein. Then someone, simply someone, had, like, told them the tropes of a mummy movie, and they have tried to, like, make a film just on that information. Like, all of the tropes of mummy movies are here, don't get me wrong. And they're here in abundance. You have the mummy walking around slowly, arms outstretched, killing people on a, a like, a, a master's bidding. You have a map leading to an ancient tomb. You have an ancient love story. And you even have the mummy sinking into, like, the water at the end, which is clearly inspired by the mummy sinking into the swamp at the end. But these have all been crammed into such a small amount of time that it also means that a lot of these tropes are also completely meaningless. For instance, I had no idea why the mummy was killing his victims and only realised over 40 minutes in that these were basically people who had laughed at the professor's work. I don't think that any of these people had been introduced before this point or, well, if they had, it certainly hadn't been in an obvious way. On top of that, it made the motivations for the characters really hard to understand. I have no idea why the, the good, like, reporter character is going after the, the professor at the beginning. 
I suppose I can kind of guess why the professor's trying to create the, you know, elixir of immortality, but by the same token, I do also feel that that element needed to be made clearer as well. All of this means that, although I, I was never lost while watching this film, I always felt like I was on the cusp of being lost. I guess in a way that is an achievement, don't get me wrong, but it also made the, for a particularly unpleasant viewing. So overall, as you would probably guess, this is quite a hard film for me to rate. I'm sure this film has, uh, you know, its fans out there. I'm sure there's people that see genius in the madness, but, and you know, if that is the case, then more the power to them. By, by the same token, it's not as if I haven't found some entertainment in this film. I enjoyed some elements of it. Like, for instance, I enjoyed the, uh, the overacting, as I, I felt it was quite suitable for the film. I liked how colourful many of the characters were. I liked how the film used Frankenstein. And although I'm, you know, uncertain whether I was laughing for the right reasons, I did find some parts funny. So, um, Igor singing operatically was, was a great scene, as was the mummy bringing a bouquet of flowers to um, the heroine, which I, I'm not going to lie, that was a great scene. And although I, I would also call this one, I suppose, a bit of a negative. The franticness was to a degree enjoyable. However, in all honesty, I can't say I had a good time watching this. The film felt like it was simply trying to hit all of the plot points of a mummy movie, but in a way that almost made it feel as if the director had just been, you know, told the tropes without ever seeing them. On top of that, I don't understand the, the character like progressions at all. And I, I was only just able to follow the film, which made the viewing quite unpleasant to watch, like it wasn't enjoyable. Therefore, overall, I'm sure this film has its fans, and if you're one of them, more the power to you. That, that's, that's cool, you know, fine. But this one just, just wasn't for me. I am giving this film a 3 out of 10. Thank you very much for listening. I certainly hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have, please do like, subscribe, uh, leave a comment. If you do so happen to know a, a mad scientist who is trying to bring a mummy back from the dead, why not tell him about this podcast? I mean, if he's found the elixir of life, uh, he's got some time to kill. And you know, it's something I never mentioned, but well, there's over a hundred episodes of this podcast, so, you know, there's plenty there for him to, uh, to keep him occupied. More if he goes to my Patreon. <laughs> You've got to get the, the cheap plug in there somehow, I guess. On the other hand, uh, let's say you are a mad scientist. Instead of sending the mummy to kill, uh, to kill people, why not send it out with flyers for the Mummy Movie Podcast? I honestly can't think of a more suitable mascot for this show than an actual living mummy. Also, okay, so if it's like this film where you're sending the mummy out to kill people who essentially laughed at, at you, just think, right? The mummy will burst through their door, proving that you succeeded. Then rather than killing them, the mummy will give them a flyer for the Mummy Movie podcast. That person is going to be like, whoa, <laughs> boy, do I have egg on my face. Not only did that mad scientist actually raise a mummy from the dead, he also gave me an excellent podcast suggestion. I'd better go thank him and apologise. And honestly, don't you think an apology will feel far better than vengeance? <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for listening. And join me next time where, finally, we have arrived at one of my most anticipated films for a while. The Robot versus the Aztec Mummy. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, I hope you all have an excellent next couple of weeks, and see you then.